Hello, I'm Joanne Langham and I'm one of your course leaders. Today we're going to be looking at the history of management. The practice of management can be traced back to 3000 BC, to the first government organisation developed by the Sumerians and the Egyptians. But the formal study of management is actually a relatively recent construct. The early study of management, as we know it today, began with what is now called the classical perspective. The classical perspective emerged during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Factories that began to appear in the 1800s posed challenges that earlier organisations had not encountered in tooling, organising, managerial structures and in training employees. Many of these employees were non-English speaking immigrants. We also had problems with scheduling complex manufacturing operations and then dealing with increased labour dissatisfaction and therefore resulting strikes. These myriad of new problems and the development of large complex organisations demanded a new approach to coordination and control and therefore a new subspe subspecies of what we think of as economic man. The salaried manager was born between 1800 and 1920, where the number of professional managers in the United States grew from 161,000 to more than 1 million. And similar growth occurred in other Western nations, such as Australia, the UK and New Zealand. These professional managers began developing and testing solutions to the, to the mounting challenges of organising, coordinating and controlling large numbers of people and thus increasing worker productivity. Therefore, this began the evolution of modern management with the classical perspective. This perspective contains three subfields, each with slightly different emphasis. We have scientific management, bureaucratic organisations, and administrative principles. Scientific management emphasises scientifically determined jobs and practices as the way to improve efficiency and labour productivity. In the late 1800s, a young engineer, Frederick Winslow Taylor, proposed that workers could be retooled like machines their physical and mental gears recalibrated for better productivity. Taylor insisted that improving productivity meant that management itself would have to change, and further, that the manner of change could be determined only by scientific study, hence the label scientific management. Taylor suggested that decisions based on rules of thumb and tradition be replaced with precise procedures. He believed that these procedures could only be developed after a careful study of individual situations. Taylor's approach is illustrated by the unloading of iron from rail cars and the reloading of finished steel in the Bethlehem Steel Plant in, sorry, in 1898. Taylor calculated that with the correct movements, tools and sequencing, each man was capable of loading 47 and a half tonnes per day instead of the typical 12 and a half tonnes. He also worked out an incentive system that paid each man $1.85 US per day for meeting the new standard, an increase from the previous rate of $1.50 a day. Productivity at Bethlehem Steel shot up overnight, and this is why Taylor is known as the father of scientific management. Taylor, however, was not alone in this area. Henry Gant, an associate of Taylor's, developed the Gantt chart system. This is a bar graph that manages missions planned, completed work alongside each of the production areas by time elapsed. Other important pioneers in this area were the husband and wife team, Frank B and Lillian Gilbreth. Lillian and Frank pioneered the time and motion study and arrived at many of their management techniques independently of Taylor. Frank stressed efficiency and was known for his quest for discovering the one best way to do work. However, Lillian was more interested in the human aspect of work. When her husband died at the age of 56, she had 12 children aged between two and 19. The undaunted first lady of management went right on with her work 
She presented a paper in place of her late husband and then continued their seminars, consulting and lecturing. She eventually became a professor at Purdue University. She pioneered in the field of industrial psychology and made substantial contributions to human resource management. The basic idea of scientific management includes selecting workers with the appropriate capabilities, training workers in the standard methods, supporting workers and eliminating interruptions. All of this is done by also providing wage incentives. The bureaucratic organisational approach is a subfield within the classic perspective. Max Weber, a German theorist, introduced many of the concepts on bureaucratic organisations. During the late 1800s, European organisations were managed on a personal family-like basis. Employees were loyal to a single individual rather than to the organisation or its mission. The dysfunctional consequence of this management practice was that resources were used to realise individual desires rather than organisational goals. Employees, in effect, owned the organisation and used resources for their own gain rather than to serve customers. Weber envisioned organisations that would be managed on an impersonal or rational basis. This form of organisation was called a bureaucracy. Weber believed that an organisation based on rational authority would be more efficient and adaptable to change because continuity is related to formal structures and positions rather than to a particular person who may leave or die. To Weber, rationality in organisations meant employee selection and advancement based on competence rather than on who you know. Another major subfield within the classical perspective is known as the administrative principles approach, where a scientific management focused on the productivity of an individual worker, the administrative principles approach focused on the total organisation. The major contributor to this approach was Henry Fayol, a French mining engineer who worked his way up to become a head of a large mining group. In his later years, Fayol wrote down his concepts on administration based largely on his own management practices in his most significant work, known as general and industrialised management. Fayol had 14 general principles of management, several of which remain a part of management philosophy today. The humanistic perspective of management emphasises the importance of understanding human behaviours, needs and attitudes in the workplace, as well as social interactions and group processes. There are three primary subfields based on the humanistic perspective, and these are the human relations movement, the human resources perspective, and the behavioural sciences approach. Two early advocates of a more humanistic approach were Mary Parker Follett and Chester Bernard. Mary Parker Follett was trained in philosophy and political science, but she applied herself in many fields, including social psychology and management. Her work was popular with business people of her day, but was often overlooked by management scholars. Follett's ideas served as a contrast to scientific management and are re-emerging today as applicable for modern managers who are dealing with rapid changes in today's global environment. Her approach to leadership stressed the importance of people rather than engineering techniques. Chester Bernard studied economics at Harvard, but failed to receive the degree because he did not take a course in laboratory science. Bernard argued that organisations are not machines and stressed that informal relationships are powerful forces that can help the organisation if properly managed. Another significant contribution was the acceptance theory of authority, which states that people have free will and can choose whether to follow management orders. People typically follow orders because they perceive positive benefits to themselves. Managers should treat employees properly because their acceptance of authority may be critical to organisational success in important situations. The human relations movement was based on the idea that truly effective control comes from within the individual worker rather than from strict or authoritarian control. The human resources perspective combines prescriptions for design of job tasks 
with theories of motivation. In the human resources view, jobs should be designed so that tasks are not perceived as dehumanising or demeaning, but instead allow workers to use their full potential. Two of the best known contributors to the human resources perspective were Abraham Maslow and Douglas McGregor. The management science perspectives emerged to treat problems of global warfare during the Second World War. This view is distinguished for its application of mathematics, statistics, and other quantitative techniques to management decision-making and problem-solving. During the war, groups of mathematicians, physicists, and other scientists were formed to solve military problems because those problems frequently involve moving massive amounts of materials and large numbers of people quickly and efficiently. The techniques had obvious applications to large-scale business firms. The management science techniques were enhanced with the development and perfection of the computer. Coupled with the growing body of statistical techniques, computers made it possible for managers to collect, store, and process large volumes of data for quantitative decision-making. And the quantitative approach is widely used today by managers in a variety of industries. Management sciences has three subsets, operations research, operations management, and management information systems. Systems thinking is the ability to see both the distinct elements of a system or situation and the complex and changing interactions amongst these elements. We will focus on systems thinking later in the course. The contingency view is distinguished from the classical perspective. As the classical view assumed a universalist view, management concepts were thought to be universal. In the contingency view, each situation is believed to be unique. The contingency view tells us what works in one setting might not work in another. Total quality management is another concept that permeates modern management thinking. The quality movement is strongly associated with Japanese companies, but emerged due to the influence of Americans after the Second World War. The ideas of Edward Deming, the father of TQM, was the basis of this movement and focuses on managing the total organisation to deliver better quality to customers. In TQM, all employees are focused on the customer. Companies find out what the customer wants and they then try to meet those expectations. Benchmarking developed through this movement and this is where companies would try to find other companies who did things better and then they would try to imitate or improve on it. Continuous improvement also emerged during this period. Today, a great deal of business is conducted digitally. E-business refers to the work that an organisation does by using electronic linkages. E-commerce is a narrower term referring specifically to business exchanges or transactions that occur electronically. Knowledge management is also important in today's technologically driven world. Knowledge management refers to the efforts to systematically find, organise and make available a company's intellectual capital and to foster a culture of continuous learning and knowledge sharing so that a company's activities build on what is already known. Customer relationship management systems collect and manage large amounts of customer data, making better decision-making and superior customer service possible. Social media is also used for many things, including marketing, public relations, and to look into the background of prospective employees. Finally, open innovation is the latest management practice using collaborative approaches for the disruption and improvement of an organization's product services or business practices. We will discuss this in more detail later in the course.